I think about, you know, maybe a, a, a young adolescent that's being bullied at school and feels like the social outcast, right? That when they find the gaming, when they find a group that's inclusive of them, because they're impressed with gaming skills, right? So I remember when my uh, oldest son was younger and he might have been 19 or 20 and he was playing a game and I was listening from the other room and I could hear this little tiny voice that had to be, you know, eight years old or something playing the game with him. And of course the 19 year olds are all swearing, saying things they shouldn't do, trash talking each other. And I remember yelling, Nick, stop playing with that little kid that's so inappropriate and he said he's our best team player <laughs> you know? so he wasn't willing he's to give him up <laughs> he wasn't willing to give him up he was on his team uh so you know that i just think that sometimes that inclusion feels so good mm -hmm. that uh, that it is what strokes ego and helps people maybe for some sadly the first time in their life that they feel that the Faithful and True Podcast. We're happy to be back again today with our host, Dr. Greg Miller, as usual. Yes. As, and uh, our guest, Dr. David Delmonico. Uh, we introduced David on the last podcast. Uh, he is a member of the Faithful and True team. He is one of our val highly valued counselors on staff, uh, but he also lives way out of the east in Pennsylvania. Way out there. So we're thrilled that yes, uh, he, he, has, <laughs> he has come to town uh, and uh, is given uh, us some of his time today. Uh, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, for those of you who are joining us again, we're going to continue our conversation about the relationship of gaming and sexual addiction. Um, and today we're going to begin by talking about just technology in general. And I know that, David, that's been something that you've been interested in for a while. It's kind of just how the, the world of technology and what it does to us and how we're kind of invited into that. Mm -hmm. So as we begin, what are some of the, the principles that we need to understand about that virtual world or technology? Well, I think, I think one of the primary things, there's a, uh, there's a researcher who's coined a term called online disinhibition. And what he means by that is that when we get into the digital world, we're less inhibited. We're more likely to take risks. We're more likely to cross boundaries that we wouldn't cross in the real world. And there are a number of components. We talked a little bit about the accessibility component in the last podcast. Uh, we've certainly talked about the idea of fantasy, uh, the idea that we can escape reality through some of these. Those are actually the things that he talks about mm -hmm. in there, is that we can use those things to feel less inhibited when we're in the online world. And of course, for people who struggle with their sexuality, uh, one of the last things we want is to feel less inhibited in that world where we're now taking risks and crossing boundaries. So we might start by, you know, looking at pornography and that uh, it switches over to, to chats with other people that become sexualized chat and then arranging to meet and how easy that becomes in that online world. Uh, the other piece is just the idea of, of what's called flow. The idea that when we get into the digital world, we kind of get into this trance-like state, right? And I think we all do this. It's not just people who struggle with their behavior, right? So I sit down to check my email one last time before I go to bed at 10.30, right? And at one o'clock, I'm still on the computer doing something and I'm like, oh my gosh, where did right. the time go? Mm -hmm. And so I think for a lot, of, a lot of people that get into the online world, whether it's gaming or sexuality, that that also becomes, the, it's almost like an altered state that they get in. You combine those two, you combine the flow and that altered, the, the, that flow and that online disinhibition, and you've really created a recipe for some problematic behavior. Well, and what may also be true is I get to be a better fantasized version of myself virtually. Mm -hmm. So if I'm playing a game, I do get to be the assassin at the top of the building. I do get to be the guy who kills the aliens or wins the, the, uh, wins the game with the touchdown. Mm -hmm. So it's like an improved version of me. So I'm not only less inhibited, but maybe I have more sense of confidence and I have a greater sense of self that I'm bringing to that experience which then even pushes me further across some of those boundaries. Yeah, and people, it's interesting if you talk to gamers, they really get attached to their avatars, 
right? They really become kind of that representation. So when my kids play, they always use the same character over and over again because they have a certain affinity for that character, the, uh, you know, whether that, how that character is dressed or the skills that that character has. And so people project themselves into the game. And I know Elizabeth uh, Griffin has been on your podcast before. I was joke with her. We, we were doing a presentation where we had to have avatars uh, in this online world and we had to go shopping for her for, you know, the right outfit. <laughs> and, you know, it's like we, so she had this affinity for this is my avatar. Mm -hmm. I have to represent myself in this virtual world. So there is a sense of self being represented in right. that world too. Well, and maybe even attributes that I, I question, do I have or are they good enough? So in my alternative virtual world, I get to be courageous, mm -hmm. or maybe in the rest of my life I don't feel courageous. Yeah, or right. I, I learn mm -hmm. that I can be engaging and social and confident, whereas in real life I would never talk to someone right. you know, and just begin a conversation, but in the virtual world with a chat, I'll engage anybody that is out there. And that's that online disinhibition mm -hmm. that serves both a really positive thing and a negative, right? Mm -hmm. So I talked about it in the negative way, but what you're describing is there are some positive aspects to online disinhibition. People can, I, I see this a lot with individuals with disabilities, right? They're seen in the real world as always being in the wheelchair or always being seen as having an autistic disorder or something like that where, where they feel like they really can't present in the world uh, without judgment. Yet they get into the online world and they're able to disinhibit and be just be who they are. Judgment you know, free zone. Judgment free. People kind of accept them and their humor and their personality rather than judging them for a disability. Right. For well, and I think, Randy, that idea of a judgment free zone is part of what makes the pornography and that world so powerful is because, especially if I grew up in a conservative or religious background where I'm being told that some of my desires are not appropriate or sinful or wrong then I enter into this sexual world virtually and those things that I feel cause me to be rejectable, I'm actually being accepted for. Mm -hmm, right. you know, I, I often say part of the power of pornography is the people that you are watching in pornography actually want you to watch them. Mm -hmm. You're invited, you're included, whereas other people may judge you for this, they're never going to judge you for right, that. Right. So if I can step into a space and not be judged, for something that I'm judging myself for, that's going to be very powerful and attractive. Right, yeah. I think those are all great points that help us kind of connect why the digital world, why technology is such an attractive thing. And again, I want to emphasize that it really isn't just for people who struggle. This is the nature of technology right. in general. <clears throat> and then you take individuals who struggle with a behavior and you put them into that world, it's almost like you're laying a magnifying glass over top of mm -hmm. what may have been a problem before now becomes even more uh, exaggerated or exacerbated. Well, and you know, one of the things that we often encourage is somebody may be struggling with something that is different from me. And, you know, the, one of the principles of recovery is don't compare, identify. So mm -hmm. for that mom or dad that is concerned about how much time their son or daughter is playing a video game to reflect on how much time do I spend online? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I'm not playing a video game, but maybe I just spent two hours looking at Facebook or Instagram. Yeah. Or like you said, maybe I just spent two hours doing my email. Right. And I can justify it because it's my work. But again, I'm entering into this alternative space that is taking me away from the reality of my family or what time it is. And so when we begin to identify, that creates a safer space for people to talk about and own what is going on. But as soon as there's judgment, we pull back and there's less freedom to really be honest about our struggles or our challenges. Right. And I think as, as uh, adults, as older adults, we tend to push a lot of that judgment on the kids. I used to do a lot of training for uh, internet safety and how to keep kids safe online. And I remember presenting to this audience of, you know, 20 parents or something that were in the room. And I noticed that two, two people had gone outside the room just before I started and never came back in. And they were out on their phone the entire time. Mm -hmm. So they came to the workshop to learn about how their kids struggle <laughs> with their online behavior and spent the entire time on their phone outside the room. So I think we just, you know, again, different doesn't always mean bad. And I think we have to remember that 
we we may all struggle in different ways, right. even though. Uh, well, and you mentioned this on the last <clears throat> um, podcast, but I think it's important for us to say it again. We do. We we it is typical to have a stereotype of gamers. We we limit whoever the we is. I limit who that is. Um, but to recognize that gaming is this expanded thing that includes many of us or all of us in some form, and. Part of the game is there is a challenge, that we are trying to meet that challenge. And we can have success with that challenge. We either win or lose. Mm -hmm. And so there is something enticing to take something that has, it's, you know, there's something at stake, but there's not really anything at stake. Right. So that gives us more opportunity to risk and um, be more aggressive in ways that typically we may not be. And that creates some of that vulnerability that we all can have when we're playing that game and get a little too competitive. Right. You know, that part of us comes out. But um, we're all vulnerable to this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, are there some principles that you think are helpful? So we know that this is true, that we're going to be less inhibited when we enter in. Are there some principles that are helpful for me to acknowledge that that's true I may not necessarily be able to be completely in control of it, but I can monitor it or, or modify it if I'm at least aware of it. So are there some things that we can do, whether I'm playing a game or going to check my email, that can create a little bit more safety? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, uh, that we do, and, and this has been done in a lot of different ways, uh, but it's using uh, kind of a technology health plan where you think about what are some things that I really should stop doing online? What are things that create unsafety, if that's a word? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of what we call our red zone behaviors. Right. What are the things I really shouldn't be doing that are going to cause me problems? And just to, to say, for those of you who have been through Faithful and True, this is the three-circle plan that we, okay. we've talked yeah. about. So either yeah. a health plan or the three-circle three circle plan. plan. But make one specific exactly. for technology right, or specific to gaming or, you know, whatever it is that you're struggling with to really pay attention. Am I able to spend, you know, seven days away from this technology? Am I, am I able to give myself a break from it? If not, that should be a red flag, right? And then, of course, the, the inner, the middle circle, the yellow circle uh, in between, thinking about things you're testing out to figure out. Are these the things that are creating problems for me? Are they okay sometimes? You know, can I get on and game uh, sometimes when I need a little bit of escape, escape, but I don't have to do that every day, you know, or can I, uh, can I do that before 10 p.m.? Because when I game after 10 p.m., I know I'm going to be up till 4, mm -hmm. you know, so those types of things. And, well, then, and can I game yeah. with a timer? Right. You know, can I set the, and then honor the timer? Part of the, it's kind of like the snooze alarm. Right. Where the alarm goes off, but we're not ready to get out of bed, so we just keep hitting snooze. Yeah. How yeah. far can you throw a timer? Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's yeah. one thing to set a timer. It's another to pay attention and say, okay, it's gone off. Wherever I am, I'm just going to turn the game off. Right, right. Or get offline. Yeah, there's a, my son plays a game called Zombies. <laughs> and uh, in Zombies, there's no end. Uh, it's just that you're continually... Uh, up leveling up for the entire year. There goal will is, always be more there's zombies. There's always more zombies, <laughs> always. And so the goal is to get as high as you can. So, you know, I'll say, uh, hey, can you give me a hand with something I'm, I'm working on in the kitchen? And I'll say, as soon as I finish my game. Well, I know that's a setup. <laughs> yeah, a, there is no way. The, the, my next question is, are you playing zombies? Because <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. I need to know if you're ever coming in or not. Uh, so, you know, again, I think there is that, that idea that it just is so accessible, so unending. And I think those are some of the things that make it a little bit different than, than other addictions. Right. You know, what, what is interesting is there, again, I don't know a lot, back in the day, it seemed like there were games that you would actually end. Mm -hmm. You would finish that final level, you would capture the thing. And what was true is for a lot of people that finished the game, there was profound grief. Yes. Because yeah, this thing that had been so important to them, yeah. they had accomplished it. And in some cases, they would try to replay it again, but it just wasn't as mm -hmm. exciting because they had figured it out. Right. So some gamer somewhere said, let's create a game they, where there's no, there end, is no end, and right. we'll have these people for life. Right. That right. intentional invitation to stay engaged. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, it, with the three circle plan, we know what's in the red circle. These are the things that we are not going to do. The yellow circle are those things that we need to have caution around that if we don't monitor those, 
They will move us into the red circle. And then the final outlier circle is the green circle. So what would it look like to have a green circle strategy around um, technology? Is it green circle involving technology or is the green circle simply not about technology? Well, I think in the technology health plan, it is about technology. Mm -hmm. You know, you can certainly create these green circles for other other behaviors as well. But what I want to emphasize is that technology can serve you. You don't always have to be in service of technology. Mm -hmm. And finding ways to have it enhance your recovery, you know, have it contribute to. So how can I, you know, find a 12-step meeting? How can I read blogs for people who are in recovery that inspire me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go watch a podcast from Faithful and True. Doing things in that green circle that when I'm not engaged in red or yellow behaviors actually enhance my behavior, you know, mm -hmm. enhance my recovery rather than detract from it. And that's what I think about when I think about that outer green circle. What are some of the things I can do to enhance my recovery? Um, in the last podcast, you mentioned that um, there is a movement towards seeing um, a, a, a video game addiction, you know, as, a, as an issue. Are you aware, are there any 12-step groups specifically for this particular issue? Um, or is that something that probably in the future we may see more and more of? Because... Typically, the 12-step community does respond when they begin to see a need and people come together around that need. Yeah. So I think I haven't seen specific groups, specific 12-step groups for uh, internet gaming. Uh, I've seen some attempts to kind of create, and I think that's where a lot of the A groups, the 12-step mm -hmm. groups come from, uh, are those grassroots kinds of movements. So I think we will start to see some growth in those areas. Uh, I've seen a lot of parallels to gambling addiction, mm -hmm. where a lot of the functions of gaming very similar to gambling. And so a lot of people who struggle with their gaming might go to Gamblers Anonymous. And certainly the principles of AA apply across uh, addictions, as we know. And so, uh, you know, I would certainly say that if you were someone who really struggled with the internet gaming piece or the digital gaming or even the cell phone gaming to the point where those three things we talked about earlier were problematic, that there are some groups that you can mm -hmm. go to for some help. You know, I, I read somewhere, and you know, I, I can't quote anything or you know, note the source. I do remember reading somewhere that um, the earlier we are exposed to something, the more vulnerable we are to it becoming an addiction. Mm -hmm. And this was talking specifically around alcohol. So yeah. if somebody starts drinking in junior high or high school, the chances of them becoming an alcoholic are greater. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, it makes perfect sense that for those that are vulnerable to gaming becoming an addiction, it's going to be pretty significant because for many people, gaming does start when they are an adolescent. And so they're developing those associations, those patterns of relating to the game early on neurochemically and as their brain is developing, mm -hmm. which then is going to create a vulnerability later on. Right. Would you speculate that that is probably true that the younger you begin, the more impact it could have later on. Yeah, I think that has been shown, you know, not only in the substance abuse field, but also in pornography, where the earlier the exposure, the goal often is not if people are going to be exposed to pornography, it's the when. Mm -hmm. And if we can delay that exposure longer, the better chance we have of them not being triggered into kind of a sex addiction. I will disagree with you a little bit, though, because I think gaming starts for two-year-olds now. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you were putting it in that adolescent, right. I'm thinking, you know, I, I watch people in the restaurant when they're trying to get their two-year-old to be quiet. They hand them the phone and say, here, play this game for a little while. Just be quiet and mm -hmm. don't interrupt everybody's meal. Right. So I think we're seeing that age of exposure drop back even further um, and it's just amazing to me how young kids can be when they learn the hand-eye coordination mm -hmm. of moving a mouse to click on the game that they want to play on that computer. And so I do think that we're going to see a lot more of that, ex that digital exposure um, that might result in mm -hmm. some problematic behavior as adults. Sure, sure. Well, using the language that we, we talk about here, you know, a wise man or a wise woman can play games. They can enjoy them. They can be satisfied by them. They have their yes, they have their no. Or it can become a survivor strategy. 
And one of the things that we are aware of with Mark and Depp's book, um, The Seven Desires, that if I'm not careful, whatever my acting out behavior may be, whether it's sexual or technology, gaming, um, I can be trying to meet those desires through those experiences. And so as we think about this idea of being heard and understood or being chosen or being included, um, there are ways that I can begin to believe that those needs can be met through some sort of experience. And there is some validity to this idea. If I'm a part of a gaming community, I am being included by them, which can be very powerful. Um, but also that idea that my virtual world must in some way be balanced with the, I don't know what we say, the real world, real the, world. the yeah. actual world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that as I step into that space, and maybe some of those needs are being met, I also have opportunities for them to be met outside of that world. Yeah, I think there is that balance of trying to trying to figure that out. And so I think about, you know, maybe a, a, a young adolescent that's being bullied at school and feels like the social outcast, right? That when they find the gaming, when they find a group that's inclusive of them, because they're impressed with gaming skills, right? So I remember when my uh, oldest son was younger and he might have been 19 or 20, and he was playing a game and I was listening from the other room and I could hear this little tiny voice that had to be, you know, eight years old or something playing the game with him. And of course the 19 year olds are all swearing, saying things they shouldn't do, trash talking each other. And I remember yelling, Nick, stop playing with that little kid. That's so inappropriate. And he said, he's our best team player. <laughs> you know? So he wasn't willing he's to give him up. Butt. <laughs> he wasn't willing to give him up. He was on his team. Uh, so, you know, that I just think that sometimes that inclusion feels so good mm -hmm. that, uh, that it is what strokes ego and helps people, maybe for some, sadly, the first time in their life mm -hmm. that they feel that. Well, and, and what's interesting is the, the one thing we all have in common initially is this game. Mm -hmm. And so for someone who questions, will I fit in? Do I have a place? Where do I belong? It's the question of where do I sit in junior high in the cafeteria? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm guaranteed a place at the table if I like this game and the better I get yeah, at it, the right. more currency I have yes. and the more likely I'm going to be included. Absolutely. And so there is this part of the game that can be meaningful for that person that finds themselves struggling socially, they find it in this virtual world. But again, it's about helping that same person transition so that there's a balance where not all of their relationships have to do with something virtually. That's right. And I think that that is possible. I think that you can start using that virtual street credibility to help them learn to be braver in situations, to take risks. So I've seen examples where maybe they find somebody online that they go to high school with that they didn't realize even played the same game. Now they're playing the game with them and all of a sudden that person's now talking to them in high school, mm -hmm. right? And so there can be these bridges where you can use the electronic world to help people bridge. But I think it has to be very intentional because it's easy to stay in our comfort zone of the virtual world and not take those risks outside of that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's why we've seen such an increase in, I used to do these presentations and I'd, there'd be an audience of a hundred people and I'd say, how many know someone who's met their husband or wife online? And there might be one hand that would go up. Ask that question now and you'll get at least three fourths of the audience. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing this is that just feels like a safer, more secure, place to kind of meet people and then kind of practice before we go out into the real world. But if that relationship stays online and never moves to the offline world, I think that's when we start to see the intimacy development and the courtship process not happen. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, and we, we often talk about this idea of, for many of the men who come through our workshop, technology has been destructive. They have mm -hmm. used it in a destructive way. Right. And what is incredibly powerful is when they begin to use it in this redemptive way that actually supports their recovery. Right. And so the texting that was once destructive, now I'm actually reaching out to my yes. community. Right. Um, I'm now doing my therapy on Zoom, right. or um, I now have a community that we meet on Zoom, so that I'm actually redeeming something that was destructive. That's right. That's right. And for someone who 
um, does struggle in with this addictive energy with their game. What may be true is they need a season of sobriety yes. where they separate themselves from it, and they're going to have the same reaction of other addicts who are giving up their behavior or their substance. And maybe at some point, if they can step back into it with some um, safety and some parameters, that what can be good and redemptive about it can be realized. Absolutely. And increased self-awareness, right? Stepping back into that. That's exactly what I was thinking while you were talking, was that period of sobriety can be really illuminating for people, whether that's sobriety from sex or sobriety from gaming or sobriety from drinking or whatever it is, that period really begins, it is the illumination mm -hmm. period where you start to have some awareness. We talk about the stages of change, right? Moving through how people change. I think it's in that period where you start to realize, you know, I am really, really wanting to game and it's, it hurts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I have a headache because of the stress from work because I usually come home and game, mm -hmm. right? You're, those things become part of that self-awareness. Well, and what may be challenging is, so we believe community is a huge part of sobriety. Well, I'm trying to create some sobriety from gaming and all of my community is in gaming. Good point, yeah. That may be part of the chaos and that may be kind of a warning light on the dashboard that something needs to be paid attention to. Absolutely. That I need to expand beyond just my gaming reality. Mm -hmm. One other thing that um, I would just want to identify is, so let's say that my primary addiction was sexual addiction and I overuse gaming. Well, I start to try to become sober in sex addiction, and what we see is other places of vulnerability start to take a priority. Right. And so for someone in recovery from sex addiction, they may be now playing more time gaming because they're trying to replace the time they were online doing something else. And what may be true is that that may be a healthier choice, and that may not be the best choice. And for the spouse who is watching the increase in gaming, that may be concerning for them mm -hmm. Because there's still this sense of not living in the full true self as a wise adult. It may be better, and it's not fully healthy yet. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, sometimes it is the, um, you know, it is the idea of harm reduction, right? Mm -hmm. That we, sometimes we do see people increase behaviors, whether it's eating, smoking, as they try to, to get sober in one area. What I'd say is if they're engaged in the counseling process, that's part of the goal mm -hmm. is to maybe that's where they need to be at now, but we're going to move them to someplace different, hopefully, uh, in the future. And that that's sometimes that's the normal part of recovery. It also emphasizes the, such the importance of that green circle mm -hmm. that you, you can't ask someone to take something out of their life that's so important without having something to replace it. So unless you have those green circle things down really well, uh, they're going to turn to things that are yellow, right? And so really working on that technology health plan to know if I back out of gaming, what am I going to do? If I back out of sexuality, what am I going to do? Right. One, one other caution is we've kind of talked about the fact that the community, the chatting, the interaction is really a part of gaming now. And so if I have a history of inappropriate chatting in my sexual addiction, then I have to be incredibly cautious to engage a game that has chatting. Because right. the pattern, that, that inhibition is already gone because I've done that. I, I know how to have sexual conversations or I know how to groom someone for a sexual conversation. Right, right. And just because I'm in a gaming platform, that doesn't suddenly go away. Right. So I need to be attentive to my own history of sexual acting out. Mm -hmm. um, as we come to a conclusion, again, I want to say we know that not everyone who games has an issue or a problem. And in fact, in our next podcast, we have a guest, someone mm -hmm. that you know, that's right. is going to come and be with us, where we do talk about there may be some positive and redemptive ways that, yes, we can still be cautious around gaming, but see some good things that can come from that also. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that conversation with uh, Dr. Kumiak. So. Yeah. Well, All thank right. You. <laughs> David, thank you so much for joining My us pleasure. again today. It's just our pleasure to have you on the Faithful and True podcast. Uh, Doctor, uh, thank you so much. As always, you were brilliant. We'd like to also thank our uh, the uh, producer of the Faithful and True podcast, Aaron Wellman. Aaron, put in a long day today. We appreciate Excellent. all of your great work as always. Uh, want to thank our listeners and our viewers for watching today's podcast. Hopefully, the message today will uh, be of benefit to you. 
We hope that this coming week will be a week for you that's filled with great blessings and great vision.